scripture reading of God's Word today, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give. Not reluctantly, are under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things that are in all times have all that you need, you will abound in every good work. It is written, He has scattered abroad His gifts to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. <coughs> you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving <coughs> to God. This service that you perform does not only supply the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies, accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. <coughs> and in the prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for His incredible gift. Children's Church. So do you get that song multiplied? Think about it this way. Think about being in a dark cave where there's no light and there's this big stash of diamonds on the wall, but you have no idea they're there until that light hits it. And then it reflects everywhere in that dark cave. It just multiplies everywhere, the brilliance. And that's what our hallelujahs are supposed to be. That's what our life is supposed to be. We're the salt and light of this earth. Let our hallelujahs be multiplied. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for this beautiful day, the renewing of life, the reminder that as spring comes, you have given us life through Jesus Christ. A life that can conquer the things of this earth, that we're not a prisoner and a slave to sin anymore, but that we have the power to overcome through Jesus Christ. We thank you for your spirit. And Father, we pray that your spirit today just presses upon our hearts the words that you would have us to hear from your words and let us apply them and let us be that light that multiplies and reflects the teachings of Jesus Christ, that we will be like Christ to bring glory and honor to you and light to this dark world. We just pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <coughs> So today is entitled, How Much Should I Give? That's a common question that we hear a lot of times from Christians. How much should I give? <laughs> Merle and I were talking about it a few weeks ago. And he said, you ought to preach on tithing. Well, tithing is a subject a lot of people don't like to talk about because sometimes they offend people. So if I offend you today, remember it's Merle's idea, okay? <laughs> But also remember that I'm going to preach out of God's Word. So if you get offended today, it's not Merle, it's not me. You need to get with God and see what's offensive and, and take that to Him and satisfy yourself. In the NIV, tithing is mentioned 32 times in the Old Testament, four times in the New Testament. So it's more of an Old Testament concept. We'll see that at first. So how much should I tithe? Well, when I was studying... I found out that the root word goes back to quarterus, which means really means 25%. So we should be giving 25%. No, I just made that up. It didn't come from quarters or anything. I just want to see it. 
What are you talking about? I thought it was 10. Okay? Because that's our attitudes. I got to give 10%? Do I need to give 10% of my gross? 10% of my net? Have you ever heard people say that? Well, you know, I'm thinking to myself when I hear that question, I'm sure that God will want to pay taxes first before we give to Him, right? I, I don't know about that. But anyway, should Christians tithe today? There's a big question. A lot of people that you ask will say yes. Do you want to give 10%? Give 10%. Don't, don't let anything stop you. If you want to give more, give more. But should Christians tithe? No. They should not tithe. Whoa, what's he saying? That's an Old Testament principle. We should give offerings to God. And we'll look at what we give, and you'll find out if you study that the Israelites gave much more than 10%. But that's part of the Mosaic law, part of the law that when Jesus came, he didn't come to put away with the law, but he came to complete the law. So what is a tithe? Simply put, a tithe is 10%. It's a giving of 10% that God set apart as holy. And it was part of the Old Testament law, the Mosaic law, which the Israelites were bound to keep. Should you only give 10% of your income? If you study more, it's much more than 10% of your income. It's 10% of everything in your life, your time, your talent, your abilities, everything else. And when Jesus came, didn't He give much more than 10%? What if He decided to give us 10% on the cross? What if He gave us 90% on the cross? He gave us 100%. He gave us all. And He commands us to do the same. So when we look at, at the Bible, we'll look at different things and we'll see that Jesus doesn't teach on tithing. And we'll see what He does say about tithing. So the first time you find tithing mentioned in the Old Testament is Leviticus 27, verse 30 in the NIV. It says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. If you look at the NLT, it'll explain it a little bit better. It says one-tenth of the produce of the land, where the grain from the fields or fruit from the trees belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to Him as holy. See, God was saying, you wouldn't have anything if it wasn't for me. So the very first fruits are mine. Remember that. Remember the God who takes care of you, who supplies all of your needs. And give 10%, for it is holy. So how much should I give? 10%? Well, let's go further and see. That's not the first time t that tithing is mentioned. Okay? You've got to remember what tithing is. It's a tenth. So Leviticus is not the first. You've got to dig back further. You've got to get back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 14, verses 14 through 20 says, When Abraham heard this, his relative had been taken captive. Talking about Lot. He called out to the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them and he, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. After Abraham returned from defeating Keterlamor, and the kings allied with him. The king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abram, I'm sorry, not Abraham, by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High who delivered our enemies into our hand. Then Abram gave 10% of everything. 10%. And not only of his income or anything, but 10% of everything. We see tithing practice in the Old Testament. But did Abraham give only 10%? Abraham took his resources. He took those men and went out to save Lot. He gave much more than 10%. He put a lot on the line to save that person, that person that he loved. If you look in the New Testament, what does the New Testament say about tithing? Well, in Matthew 23, verses 1 through 4, it says, Jesus said to the crowds and to His disciples, the teachers of the laws and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. 
They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. So Jesus is given a warning. He's teaching us. The Pharisees teach this Mosaic law. And the reason that they teach this is they put heavy burdens on other people so that you can accomplish what I can accomplish. They're living on their works of righteousness. So if we read further in verse 10 and 11, Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. Not Pharisees, not teachers, but the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. What does a servant do? He gives his all to his master. He doesn't have the rights or anything. He gives his time. He gives his abilities. He gives whatever the master requires of him. Okay? We keep on reading. Verse 13, 15, and 16 say, Woe, woe, woe. And in verse 23, we see woe for a fourth time. Verse 23 says, Woe to you, teachers of the laws and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, a tithe. Look at that. Jesus isn't talking about a tithe here in a way that, hey, you should do this. He's saying the Pharisees do this and don't be like the Pharisees. They're trying to burden you. They're trying to get to heaven by works of righteousness. They give a tenth of their, their spices, mint, dill, and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law. What matters is justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the, for, the former. Jesus is teaching. He's a teaching those who choose to follow Him. Those who are called to be His disciples. And remember, this is much before we've ever heard the term Christian. Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. You're saying, I understand that you're the master. I want to be trained from you so that I can be like you. So we've got to look at what Jesus teaches. In Luke 18, Luke talks about the same thing, verses 9 through 12. He said, to some who were confident of their own righteousness... That's how Luke put it. And looked down on everyone else. Jesus told him this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee. So we know who this person is who looks upon their own righteousness and looks down at others. And the other was a tax collector, the chief of sinners at that time. The Pharisee stood by himself alone in his own righteousness and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, and even you, tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth, a tithe of all I get. I am somebody because I tithe. That's what a tithe had become. It had become a restriction, a requirement of the law. But Jesus came to fulfill the law, not so that we wouldn't give by any means, but are required to give 10%? Is it supposed to be something that we give out of obligation? Or should we give out of our heart as Christ died, as Christ gave? Jesus never taught once that we should tithe. But He constantly taught that we should give, give, give. He said, no greater love a man has than but to give his life up for his friend. That's giving everything, isn't it? That's exactly what Jesus did. He gave 100%. No amount of adhering to the law is going to save us. We're saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of God. He gave it to us freely, freely, as the song said this morning. And that's how we're supposed to give out of our whole heart, freely, freely back to Him. So should we give a tenth? Is that good enough? Should it be on our gross or on our net? In fact, Jesus is teaching us that we should give much, much more than 10%, isn't He? He wants our hearts. He wants our minds. He wants our full devotion to Him. That means that we give it all. As we look at the Sermon on the Mount, that's what we're going to look at next, Jesus teaches some radical concepts. This is the beginning of His teaching where he's talking to those who are following him. Great crowds are coming together. Who is this Jesus? We want to find out more. We want to follow him. We want to learn his teachings. So he starts some radical teachings. And they're not giving 10%. 
They're not even giving 90%, okay? So let's look at them. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, first of all, it says, Jesus began to preach. That's what He's doing. He calls 12 men. After that, He um, calls them to... Well, He calls them, first of all. He calls them to come follow Him. That's what He simply said. Come follow Me. I will make you fishers of men. That meant they had to give up everything, didn't they? They had to leave their family behind, their jobs behind. They didn't know where their security was coming from. They didn't know where their next meal was coming from. They gave more than 10%, much more. And they did it willingly, not, obliga- not out of obligation, not based on any law or custom. If you read on, Jesus tells us in chapter 5, those who will be blessed. And here's some new radical concepts. Blessed are the meek. Wait a minute. Blessed are those who are poor in this world. He continues on and he says, You are the salt and the light of the earth. We know what that's about. Salt for seasoning and preservative. And the light to bring out and expose the darkness. He tells us that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. He goes on to teach even more. More things about people that people were familiar with about the law, but how that he is coming to complete the law. He says to love your enemies, not your neighbors, not your friends. He takes the principle much further than giving 10%. In Matthew 5, verse 42, it says, Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Chapter 6 Matthew chapter 6, verse 2 says, So when you give, not if you give, but when you give, to the needy, do not, do not announce it to, with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Jesus says, when you give. And He tells us to give to the needy. He expounds upon the things that were familiar at that time and says, if you want to be my disciple, you've got to do more than what you were taught. More than 10%. Reading on in verse 19, it says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. Well, how do you do that? If you have treasures on earth, you don't want to keep them, it's not right, what do you got to do? Give them away, right? And he even said to the rich young ruler who knew, he was educated and everything, he had the heart to come after Jesus. He said, teacher, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And he said, go sell everything you have. Give it to the poor. Come back and follow me. It's not about that we've got to give it all away. It's the fact that we can't build up treasures on this earth. Our heart needs to be focused on things above. Our heart needs to be focused on serving God. And if holding on to the, our other 90% or whatever it is is keeping us from serving God then we need to get that out of the way. It's a hindrance. It's a weight. And it's keeping us from being truly free. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermins destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But instead, the complete opposite, store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. How many of you are familiar with banks? Come on, let me see some hands. We know what a bank is, right? You know, banks in Japan are paying negative interest because they don't want you to put your money in there. They want to invest your money. So they're paying you negative interest on your money. Whoever heard of such? But we're familiar with what a bank is. And I'm going to give you a definition of a bank. And you can see if you, <coughs> you agree with it or not. It's a place where you deposit your valuables for safekeeping for future use. You agree with that enough? Okay. If you agree with that, then there are different types of banks, aren't there? There are food banks and blood banks. Not just financial banks, right? What do you do with a food bank and a blood bank? You put in blood so that someone else can use it, don't you? What do you do with a food bank? You put in food so someone else can use it. Wait a minute, what about my financial bank? I don't like the idea of putting my money in my bank for someone else to use, do you? Just a thought, okay? You know what a leech is? Or a parasite? They suck nutrients from others. If we deposit blood and food because people need those nutrients to live, the Bible also teaches us to give to the needy, which comes out of our financial, as well as coming out of 
out of our lives, our time, our effort. Parasites and leeches don't give, they only take. Is that how you handle your finances? Is that how you practice your giving? Do you think God gave you as much as He gave so you could hold on to it? It says not to build up treasures in this earth. So when you practice your giving, are you a Christian leech? Or do you give out of a free heart as Christ gave? Do we really need to ask a question of whether we should give 10% and whether it should be on our gross or our net? We're missing the point just like the Pharisees when we ask that question, aren't we? And don't worry, I've asked that question before too. Okay? Jesus is saying, if you want to be my disciple, then come follow me. Do what I do. Do what I teach. And he gave up everything because of how much he loved each and every one of us. Every one of us, no matter what we did, no matter who we are, no matter how bad, no matter how good, he loved every one of us. Luke 6.38 says, Give, and it will be given unto you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Going back to Matthew in chapter 6, he tells us not to worry about the things of this world. God is the one who provides everything in the first place. He tells us not to worry about a thing that God will take care of all of the, our needs. He will provide for all of our needs. Verse 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you. If your priority is seeking God's will for your life, doing what Jesus has taught you, He'll give to you. He'll give to you like you never imagined. It may not be monetary things on this earth, it may not be a healthy life. It may not be the happiness that we find in this earth. But you will be storing up treasures in heaven. You will be making a difference. Others will see your light and it will draw them to Jesus Christ. Jesus continues on teaching in Matthew 7 not to judge others. And we've got to learn that so that we can give. He tells us about the differences between false prophets and disciples. He says the path is narrow and few will find it. He didn't say it was easy. He implies just the opposite, that it's going to be hard. But he searches, God searches to and from to see whose hearts are focused on Him. It requires a life of giving. If we go to Hebrews, we'll see more of the story of Abraham. Hebrews 6.1 says... Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Isn't that what you want to do and grow and become mature? Not laying again the foundations of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God. We don't need to be stuck in laws. We need to be free. Free to live a life as Christ lived. And, and Jesus said in John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this to lay down or give one's life for one's friends. That's how much Jesus gave. I am so thankful He didn't give 10% for me, aren't you? If you read on, the author of Hebrews says this about Abraham, chapter 6, verses, verse 20 through 7, 5. Where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf, He has become the high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham, returning from the defeat of the kings, and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything, a tithe. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth, or a tithe, of the plunder. Now the law required the descendants of Levi who, became, who become priests to collect a tenth from the people. That is from, from their fellow Israelites, even though they, are, they also are descended from Abraham. It's pretty clear what tithing is and the requirements of it. If we read on in verse 11 and 12, it says, If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given 
to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come? One of the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. Not 10% anymore, guys. Much more is required because much was given. Verse 22 says, Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. That covenant that Jesus gave His life to save you or I. And He calls us as without being born again, you can't be part of the kingdom of God. He gives His Spirit so that we can overcome. So that we can learn to have peace and grace and give as He gave. Peace, hope, and love. Gifts of the Spirit that He can give you. And then you won't worry about whether you should give 10%. You'll give as much as you can. Maybe more than you can. <clears throat> the examples that I talked about um, from the New Testament never said once that we're supposed to tithe. In fact, we saw the light of tithing. It told us that that covenant law was over because there was a better covenant, that we're under a new covenant tells us that we shouldn't worry about the restrictions of the laws like the Pharisees do and practice them for that reason. Ephesians 5 verses 1 and 2 says, Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved Himself and gave Himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That's why I first said we shouldn't tithe. We should give author offerings. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, a continual offering, day in, day out, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. To give your lives, every part of it, monetary, everything else, every single minute of every day, dying to yourself, so that you can live for God. So that you can be that ambassador of Christ. That you can be that salt and that light. One Sunday, the offering plate was being passed around. And this little girl set the plate down in the middle, stood in it. And one of the ushers says, what are you doing, sweetheart? She said, well, they taught us in Sunday school to give our all to Jesus. Childlike faith, if we think of it that way, kind of makes some sense, doesn't it? An offering is something which is freely given. It is not a tithe. It is something that is not done out of obligation. It's not a matter of how much should I give. It's more a matter of how much can I give. But it's not even a matter of how much can I give, because you can't outgive God. If He's leading you to give more than you have, then guess what? He's going to give back. He's going to honor what you do. <clears throat> you are worshiping a master. It's either Satan or it's God. We fight a spiritual battle. It's not about what we can do in this world. It's not he who dies with the most toys wins. It's about realizing we're in a spiritual battle and giving our all, laying our lives down as a pleasing offering. Romans 6, 13 through 16 says, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been taught, brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves without any rights giving everything, you are slaves of the one you obey. So who are you obeying? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. See, God's not interested in your monetary. It's all His in the first place. You wouldn't be alive if He didn't give you the breath of life. 
you wouldn't still be living if He didn't give us oxygen to breathe, if He didn't give us the plants to eat, and everything else. Every good thing comes from Him, even in a sinful, fallen world. He is still in control, and He gives to everyone. And to those that He has given, that those that know that the mystery has been revealed, He expects them to give as Christ gave. Our scripture this, from this morning told us to give based on your heart. Because that giving is a reflection of your heart, your faith, your worship to God. God loves a cheerful giver. And He will bless those who give abundantly. We'll go over the scripture again. 2 Corinthians 9, 16 through 15. Remember this. So it's good we go over it again. So we will remember it, right? Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. You might think you have plenty of things in this world. But again, it's not about things in this world. If you sow sparingly according to God's plan, you will reap sparingly for eternity. You might have plenty in this world, but you won't have it where it matters. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Can't base 10% anymore, can we? Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that all, in all things, at all times, having all that you need. There's a lot of alls there, isn't it? You will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. That's more than 10% again, isn't it? And th through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it also but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. And for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for, your, for, in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you. Because of the surpassing grace God has given to you. Thanks be to God for this incredible gift. <coughs> See, the more you give, people will see it. The more that it will affect your ministry. And you do have a ministry. It's called the Ministry of Reconciliation. It's to tell others about Jesus Christ. So don't think that God doesn't have a ministry for you. We're all called to, to spread the gospel message. Sometimes I hear, where, where can I do that? How can I do that? Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, there are opportunities. If you do work, you've got eight hours a day to talk about Jesus Christ to others, to be that light, to be that salt. And the more you give, the more that they'll see that something's different about you. The more that they'll want to know about this Jesus, this Jesus who gave His all so that I might live. Giving is a gift from God. So church, we got to grow. Let us grow, Pastor. <laughs> cool. But first, we've got to learn to walk. Let us walk, Pastor. So once we learn to walk, we can run. Let us run, Pastor. All right, I like this. And once we learn to run, we can fly. Let us fly, Pastor. Let our church fly. All right. But first, church, we've got to give. Can we not crawl first? <laughs> We've got to give, give, give. 10% isn't going to cut it, guys. I'll look at one more scripture. It kind of sums up Jesus' view in tithing. Luke 21, verses 1 through 4. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. She didn't even probably have that to give. But she stepped out in faith and gave more than her all. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. 
What an example of faith. That's what Jesus is teaching us. That's the kind of servants, the kind of followers, the kind of brothers and sisters that we need to be. So should we ask 10%? Should we do that? Should we do it based on gross or net? Or should we give to God according to our heart based on what Christ gave for us? The sermon title was, How Much Should I Give? I hope you have your answer. Father, we thank you so much that you gave your Son for us. That Jesus gave up his throne in heaven. That he humbled himself. That he washed the feet of his disciples. He washed the feet of Judas Iscariot, who he knew would betray him. But still, he washed his feet. Teach us to love, Father, so that we may show this world a difference in our lives, so that they may be drawn to you. Lord, we thank you for giving us so much. Give us a heart to give back as Jesus gave, so that we can make a difference. Take away any of the deceptions that Satan has put out there, the begrudgingness in our heart, the holier-than-thou attitude. Father, let us lay them down at the feet of Jesus because He took all of that sin and shame upon Him on the cross to forever put it away where you see that in us no more. And we thank You for that. We just praise Your name and praise the Lamb who was slain for us. In Jesus' name. Amen.